Hey everyone, this is Nick from the Botch Pit. Today, we'll be discussing the Winter Court, also known as the Silent Arrow, the Onyx Court, and the Court of Sorrow for Changeling the Lost. The sources used for this broadcast were both Changeling the Lost 1st and 2nd edition core books, as well as the source books Lords of Summer and Winter Masks for Changeling the Lost. At the end of this broadcast, we will also discuss what the source book Winter Masks contains. Before we begin, let's revisit what a Changeling Court is. The Courts, as a very high-level overview, are the main structures of Changeling society. Now, don't confuse this with a Freehold. A Freehold is a local society of Changelings that have all banded together after escaping the True Fae. Think of the Courts more like their overseers, and as such, each Freehold has their own local Courts, which are usually reflections of the larger ones. For a complete, in-depth overview of what a Court entails, please visit the first recording of this series, The Autumn Court. A link is in the description below. Going forward, we're going to apply this truncation method so you don't have to listen to it over and over again. The Winter Court, the court bound to winter, sorrow, and intrigue, is the second seasonal court we will be discussing, as today is the winter solstice, the first day of winter. It's almost like this was meticulously planned out and calculated or something. No, 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 that would just be insane, perhaps crazy. Although some might say it's beautiful madness. Introduction. Winter isn't a time of great joy, but bleak, plain emptiness. The hunt ends when the fox goes into the ground. If the true fae can't find you, the winter court reasons they can't hunt you down and drag you back to fairy. In the winter, all the glory of the seasons fade to nothing, nowhere to be seen. But there is life waiting beneath the earth, hidden under the blankets of snow where it can't be disturbed. The silent arrow knows this. When the true fae come around, the winter court is gone. They are nowhere to be found. The court itself takes up whatever unoccupied location is both convenient and attractive, and abandons that place just as quickly and easily when danger or discovery threatens it. The court will indeed surface from the guise of winter until someone, or something, binds it and passes the word of that location. Abandonment is a security measure, ensuring that their enemies have a very hard time tracking them down and ambushing them. In addition to this, members of the court practice speaking in code, as this language barrier is better to conceal their intentions from their oppressors. They also leave messages for each other in ways that outsiders can't interpret nor intercept. Using contracts for this purpose is ideal, and if that can't be done, a combination of drop boxes and codes is utilized. Changelings regularly invest in security systems, mundane, magical, or both, as well as secret rooms. Some courts even arrange safe houses for their members. Their lives aren't all about paranoia and secrecy, though that element is certainly present. In their daily lives, members try to be equally subtle. They avoid attention from the neighbors by just being another guy. City life is very attractive because, amidst all those people, it's easy to just be another anonymous neighbor. Even changelings who don't have regular jobs drive off and find some place to spend their workday. Winter changelings make unremarkable employees, doing adequate but unremarkable jobs and trying not to get in trouble. This is all part of the court's effort to go unnoticed by the true fae. Not fitting into human society is a dead giveaway, so the Winter Court makes a point of fitting in seamlessly. Even the other humans barely notice Winter Court members, but not to the point of ignoring them. That would also reveal them, so they do their best to achieve this balance. Winter's lost are notoriously selfish and deceptive, but they're not exactly untrustworthy. Onyx courtiers lie to other changelings, but rarely do so to cause harm. They hate making promises, but are no worse at keeping them than anyone else. They're not altruists, but they don't hold grudges either. In most freeholds, the Winter Court's liked and hated for the same reason. They stay out of the way. Legends Not everything green and growing is kind. Once, many fair young men and women were captured for the gardens of a keeper called the Earth Mother. The Earth Mother was beautiful and giving, but she demanded utmost obedience. If someone displeased her in the smallest way, she planted them in her orchards, and they were never seen in fleshy form again. Many tried to flee her, only one succeeded. The Pale Maiden had listened and learned. She knew that the only creature that the Earth Mother feared was Winter himself. So she ran to the boundaries of the Earth Mother's gardens, and she called out to Winter to come and take her away. Winter accepted her offer, and kept her hidden away for six months before returning her to the mortal world. There, she taught others how to honor her patron, formalizing the bargain and forging the Court of Sorrow. But after six months of rule, she vanished again. Some say the Earth Mother found her again, but that's a fool's supposition. We know where she must have gone, back into Winter's Domain, to the seat he keeps for her by his throne. There was a child, 
unloved by her family, who ran deep into the woods to escape them when they were angry. She curled up in the snow, shivering, waiting to fall asleep forever. But the plumes of her breath drew Winter's attention. He came and sat beside her, and the chill of his robes drew the warmth from her, and he asked her to tell him her story. But she never complained. She never spoke of her family, and indeed she was too polite to speak of her pain at all. Winter marveled at the fortitude and manners of the small child, and announced that he would adopt her for his own. Eventually, the child came out of the woods. When she emerged, she wore a crown of ice and robes spun from heavy snowdrifts. She taught other children like her all the secrets that she learned from Father Winter. But to this day, she has never spoken as much as her old family name. Winter never wanted a bargain. He put his house under the ice at the roof of the world, in water so cold no mortal could ever swim to his door and live. When spring, summer, and autumn all agreed to aid their tiny supplicants, Winter sat in his house and shook his head. Not unless they asked me to my face, he said. But Winter had a daughter, and he had been cruel to her. When he caught her with a boy, he slashed her with a knife and threw her into the sea. So one day, a quiet fisherman went out to the sea, and he tied a pretty necklace to his fishing line, and he lowered it down to her as a gift. When she followed his line up to the surface, he tended her wounds, brushed her hair, and promised he would marry her if that's what she wanted. She carried him swiftly down to her father's house, and pushed him through the door before he could freeze or drown. Winter was very displeased that he'd been found, and that he would have a new son-in-law. But a promise was a promise. The bargain was his wedding gift. History the founder of the court was a changeling called Snowflake John. In a crowd, he could blend in seamlessly, and he was nearly impossible to tell apart from any of the other people in the street at any time. When the other court founders were challenging their seasons, he did the same by not showing up. Back when Sam Noblood was hunting Summer, and Clay Ariel was negotiating with Autumn, there weren't many volunteers to chase down Winter. Only one person declared he'd force Winter to strike a bargain like the other three. The court remembers his name as Snowflake John, though it was surely something else. They don't remember his face, though. He was called Snowflake John because you couldn't pick him out of a crowd any more than you could pick a snowflake out of a drift. Legend has it that John declared publicly his intent to earn a pact from Winter, but the challenge never materialized. John laid out his challenge to Winter, and then he disappeared. After two years, when Winter had circled the globe fully twice, Snowflake John reappeared and asserted that Winter's inability to find him had earned him the right to make a pact. He claimed it was done. He'd bested Winter because Winter hadn't managed to find him for two full turns of the seasons. It was a ridiculous claim. Surely, he wasn't telling them everything. Many claim that there was something else to the bargain, but none agree on what it is. The fact remains that the Winter Court had its pact as well as an object lesson and why some things deserve to stay secret. Themes Sorrow Members of the Court of Sorrow deal with their signature emotion much as they deal with the rest of their lives, by hiding from it. They all know it's there, hovering just out of reach on the edge of their consciousness, but they deal with it by avoiding it. In most cases, however, this is actually the healthiest thing to do. There's no way to face the sorrow of losing fairy's wonders when one never intends to go back. And what good is sorrow at one's stolen life, when there's no way to go back? Winter has always been the season of sorrow. Light is in shorter supply, and darkness comes early. The longer the night, the easier it is to mourn. Sorrow is a cage. It keeps a person from moving. It roots them in place, cold and unyielding. But people also willingly lock themselves within it. They embrace the bar's strength, for they're just as strong as the love for what was lost. They close the door to keep other people out. The Winter Court knows that sorrow can be crippling, but also inspiring. You just have to be certain you're the one holding the keys. It's extremely easy for a changeling to be drawn to sorrow. We're not just talking about the durance, we're talking about past lives. All they had to do was love enough. The lost return home to find lovers in a fetch's arms, parents dead and gone, and their children grown and unhappy. The Winter Court doesn't offer the same strength as summer and autumn, or the same abandon and hope as spring, but it never lacks for numbers. Those who join the Silent Arrow don't want to forget. However, the strength of sorrow is twofold. Turn it against your enemies, and you strike at their will to fight. Turn it inward, against yourself, and you can see through false hopes and useless temptations. So many of the true Fae aren't prepared for the pain that comes with losing something they truly loved because so many of the gentry weren't capable of truly loving in the first place. Record scratch, freeze frame, think about that for a second. Imagine trying to witness that, a creature that is incapable of love trying to cope with the loss of something that they loved. It's terrifying and extremely eerie. 
Harvesting sorrow requires discretion, much like anything else involving the winter court. Bringing their emotion of sorrow to others is rarely a matter of cruelty, but often one of kindness. They bring the sorrow of others to mind so that others may deal with it. It wouldn't do to be seen with a smile of indulgence at a funeral or when families are picking through the tornado-strewn possessions of their houses. Guilt and regret are other high-yield sources of sorrow. They are nourishing vintages, and churches and prisons are tempting sources. The more ruthless courtiers are experts at finding and reopening a mortal's old wounds, than feeding as they offer a sympathetic ear. They are less moral changelings who cause tragedies in order to benefit from the sorrow they cause, but these acts are usually discouraged, sometimes violently, by the court. Depression The Winter Court has always been at a greater risk for depression both in the sense of major depressive disorders and also in the more vernacular meaning. In the former case, it's not because something in Winter's bargain may inflict clinical depression. It's because changelings who suffer from major depressive disorder most often find their way into the Onyx Court. Depression has developed an interesting counterpart to the Winter Court's focus on remaining hidden. Pragmatism encourages a silent arrow to be ready to cut ties and run at any time. However, pragmatism also encourages them to develop safe avenues to do the things they enjoy and the people they love as a means of staving off the sorrow that surrounds them. It's a cruel contradiction. Isolation helps keep a secret, but isolation can eat at your soul. The great danger of depression is inaction. If you're always on the defensive, you can't make any sort of progress. The Turning of Seasons High Winter a freehold with an onyx monarch is like a forest in winter. The trees seem still and quiet, but their expansive roots are still quietly at work beneath the frozen ground. The Court of Sorrow systematically spreads throughout the area, blending in neatly and using the lull to its best advantage. They dissect rumors, upgrade security systems, and check to see if each freehold member kept their bug out bag up to date. You never know when you have to peace out in a hurry. Leading after an autumn rain has its advantages and disadvantages. The autumn court usually tidies up after themselves, but their tactic of fear can sometimes leave the local hedge denizens inconveniently jittery and the true fae on the alert. A winter king or queen usually seems very conservative next to their fellows. They make few open decrees, instead dispatching courtiers on secret and often deniable quests. When they require the neutralization of a threat, they commission an assassination rather than a war party. Winter has a particular tolerance for fetches, if tolerance is the right word. Very few fetches die during a winter rain to avoid stirring up trouble with the mortal world. If war comes to the freehold, a winter monarch may take to the field, leading from a fortified rear or dressing like a simple soldier, or he may direct the strategy from afar. But optimally, there will be no war while winter reigns. If their information networks, wards of misdirection, camouflage, and discreet assassinations have all been reasonably successful, the enemy will be too disoriented and scattered to challenge the freehold. They stop problems before they become problems. Low Winter When another court reigns, the silent arrow melts into the background as usual. Uh-huh, melts. Because of the winter court. Wordplay. Apart from that, the Onyx courtiers tend to really only act when directly asked. Winter courtiers play support in the freehold. They may have a variety of roles. Scouts, doctors, cleaners, communications, researchers, counselors. But they're all tied into the same information network, and any freehold with half a brain knows it. They all also know that a child of winter will lie to your face, by omission or otherwise, without thinking twice. You can't trust every word a winter courtier tells you, but you can be certain they have an enlightened self-interest that keeps them part of the freehold and are invested in the good of the freehold as a whole. The winter court demands discretion, but they offer a place to any changeling who feels safest when they're not attracting attention. They don't make the same social demands that spring and summer do. Ice Law The court upholds certain formal laws of secrecy, sometimes called the Ice Law. The Ice Law defines the most important things to protect. For instance, Winter stresses the medieval idea of courtly love to protect the heart and reputation. Hate, like love, is best kept to yourself until it threatens to consume you, and then it must be acted on with swift discretion. A winter courtier must always be ready to evacuate or vanish should the freehold suddenly fall. Many, but not all, winter court customs are codified in the ice law. Legends say Snowflake John whispered it into the hidden rhythms of the North Wind, 
In the Silent Arrow's early days, none could claim Winter's mantle unless they found the ice law in its whale and sang it back to John. But these days, it's basic knowledge, freely given to all who'd ask Winter courtiers about their ways. Would-be lawyers will be disappointed to learn that the ice law isn't a creature of strict language and ironclad precedent. The lords unbidden treat them as overarching principles, subject to the discretion first, not to presumptuous arguments of junior courtiers. It guides the daily lives of courtiers, showing them how to treat each other and outsiders. No true courtier would obey the letter of the ice law over its spirit. On the other hand, this flexible outlook has let the law change from place to place. Half the ice law in any freehold is little more than an exalted regional custom shared among a handful of places. The other half is universal and based on the following rules. 1. Let every court know its function. Winter's subjects shouldn't meddle in the affairs of the other courts. Spring, summer, and autumn courtiers should stay out of Winter's way. The ice law states that every court has a purpose and must be allowed to fulfill. It isn't a courtier's place to play with desire, wrath, and fear. The other seasons have sharpened their particular passions into unique powers that serve all the lost. War, temptation, and the eldritch mysteries of the hedge are fitting studies for any onyx scholar, but a sword, secret kiss, or word of power should be used by those destined to use it best. Spring is for society, summer is for war, autumn is for magic, the courtless are for watching. 2. Hide your love and hate. If the average freeholder knows who you love or hate, then you've strayed from winter's ideal. The court promotes emotional restraint for two reasons. The first is philosophical. Like the Stoics, the Silent Arrow believes that changelings should attain freedom by mastering their passions. The true Fey demonstrate the evils of unrestrained desire. The changeling can only be truly moral by leashing desire with his mind, uncovering the right, rational path. Love and hate are also easy ways for one's enemies to lay a trap. Seduction and rash anger drive many of the lost back into the gentry's embrace. You are the chosen one! It was said that you would destroy the gentry, not join them! Bring balance to the freehold, not leave it in darkness. You are my brother, Anakin! I loved you! I hate you! Just so you're fully aware, listening at home, I, uh, I rolled on the floor when I did that line. 3. Prepare your farewells. The law should always be ready to move on. When the gentry stalk the gates, or mortals patrol with iron weapons, it's time to go. Winter's children live simply, with very few possessions. A courtier should be ready to flee his old life at all times. If he gets too attached to a community, his feelings will slow him down. He'll waste time saying goodbye, paying debts, and tying up other loose ends. None of this matters as pursuers could corner him or steal his secrets from friends and things left behind. Every courtier should have an escape plan. They should know exactly what to do when they need to leave, where to go, how to get there, how to survive the trip, and how to rebuild their life at the destination. 4. Keep the people lost to every outsider. The Winter Court believes that secrecy is the most powerful survival mechanism the lost have. The Silent Arrow is responsible for that secrecy, not only for themselves, but for all of Arcadia's refugees. Therefore, changelings should keep mortals at a distance. This is more difficult for newly escaped changelings, some of whom have spent years fantasizing about returning to friends, families, and lovers. According to the Ice Law, these are the very people they should abandon. The court poets sometimes call the situation the second great sorrow. The first great sorrow is one's tenure with the true fae. Combined, both great sorrows define the sense of loss that follows winter subjects through life, adding a whisper of pain to experiences both magical and mundane. Personally, my favorite part of this court is the Ice Law. First of all, it sounds incredibly badass. I am the Ice Law! Secondly, I really enjoy the code of conduct framework it allows both players and storytellers to test each other on. Do you stay the direct path, and even if the storyteller makes it blatantly obvious that you should try to save someone, you don't because it violates it? Where does that line start of where you interpret the actual meaning of the ice law? Do you risk doing it, and the entirety of the court comes down on you? These are the seeds of a story. Also, the name really reminds me of David Tell's skit on Jägermeister, and I feel like I have to parody some of that right now for the Ice Law. I wouldn't be doing you any justice if I actually didn't. A changeling comes out of the hedge. He's covered in mud and blood. He's holding one high heel shoe. Did I just eat a dancer? Ice Law. A little girl is sitting on a swing, not swinging. They just fled a gentry attack. A single tear rolls down her cheek. Where's daddy? Ice law. It's terrible, but it's also really, really funny. This is the botch bit. What do you expect? Honestly, if this is all you get out of this video, please, 
please spread it around. Also, put your own in the comments so I can just chuckle to them like a mad person while I read them. Ice Law Give and take. Winter's Bargain is one of the strangest of them all. While the Onyx Court is in power, the others and their hounds are compelled to mourn, to truly mourn their victims. An invader cannot bloody its blade or talons a second time until it has ritually acknowledged the death of its first target. The bargain makes a winter battlefield a truly particular sight, for most true fae have no real idea how to mourn and can only approximate some form of guess. And that's when winter strikes. Against the gentry, there's no room to honor these fallen mimicries. Like all other courts, the Court of Sorrow honors and repays its patron with rituals and celebrations. Winter's practices are not as grandiose, though. Too much pageantry would defeat the purpose of subtlety, but more to the point, a truly riotous winter festival would be insulting. Rituals The Honest Court pays their debt in ritualized grief and the recognition of loss. The most famous exception, however, is the Winter Market, a bazaar that takes place the week before the winter solstice. The Winter Market is the court's best-known tradition. Most courts, however, sponsor this two or three times the season. A winter ruler can call them at any time. Vendors must gain the court's permission to set up, and most are winter courtiers trading information and confiscated goods. Courtiers plan for weeks or months in advance for this event. It's that big. The court interviews would-be merchants about their wares, wants, and personal details. If one of them deviates from their declared policies, the court shuts down their operation and bans them from future winter markets. This isn't to say it's only limited to winter courtiers. Changelings of all courts, as well as the courtless, are free to set up stalls or boots, buy, sell, run games, and trade services or information. Although, winter courtiers do make up the majority of purveyors at the winter market. The winter market is less focused than the autumn court's fall and fair, and much more open to non-magical bartering. If the winter market were just another bazaar, even a changeling bazaar, the fallen fair and goblin markets would doom it to irrelevance. The winter market serves two purposes. The first is to be a clearinghouse for the onyx court's information, confiscated goods and services, of which there are many. The second is to counter the illicit draw and influence of the goblin market. The winter market provides an opportunity for the same sort of deals and networking without forcing any changelings to expose themselves to hobgoblins, exiled fae, and loyalists who are just as likely to sell information back to fairy as they are to sell contracts to the free fae. The winter market is distinct in that all transactions gain the Silent Arrow's gift of discretion. No changeling can compel buyers and sellers to reveal their transactions unless he belongs to the Silent Arrow. Winter courtiers usually record everything that happens, but don't say a word about it unless it's relevant to the freehold's safety. Courtiers who blather about their transactions, for no good reason, are severely punished. Of course, Lost and some freeholds keep transaction records of winter markets over decades, even centuries. An innocent sale always doesn't remain so. In any event, careful analysis can tell the court many things about the freehold's resources and fortunes. Some courts use the winter market to achieve a third goal. The confluence of changeling courts gives a silent arrow an opportunity to judge the other court's capabilities and natures. It's also a chance for the court to infiltrate their peer societies. The Winter Formal, another tradition with an innocuous name, is a once-a-year masquerade. At some point in time, someone named the event after a typical high school or university dance, and the name unfortunately stuck. The court requires masks to attend, and uses tokens and subtle magic to ensure that the identities of all participants are kept secret. Tokens conceal the seeming, or makes a pact with certain entities of fairy to make identities unknowable for the evening. Concealing one's identity is mandatory, and an opportunity for free-for-all, guiltless socializing without the stress of politics, where everyone keeps secrets together. In this way, even typical enemies of the changeling courts can attend and mingle, while the changelings still feel safely hidden. Finally, Radio Free Fae is a tradition with no roots in the bargain. As such, not all winter courtiers approve of it. Radio Free Fae is a bootleg broadcast, its location constantly moving, and as secret as the identity of its participants. Its stated purpose is to share information that all law should know, even if the winter court hasn't cleared some of that information for release. It is a modern tradition spread throughout winter courts. As masters of subterfuge, the onyx courtiers are also usually at the heart of any underground movement. Radio Free Fae is a method of disseminating information that all law should know without divulging the location of 
either the sender or the receiver. The broadcast station can be tracked down, but it moves regularly. Surprisingly, not all winter courts support Radio Free Fay, and it is sometimes upheld by an underground movement within the court itself. There's only so much silence, secrecy, and forced humility a person can take, even a winter courtier. Radio Free Fay demonstrates another side of the court that's a bit more carefree. These rebels never rise high in the hierarchy of lore, unless they're putting on an act while they're up to something really devious. But they do put a more sympathetic face on the usually taciturn winter crowd. Most of the more vivacious changelings respect their elders enough to replace the court's traditional silence with some degree of misdirection, so winter's black sheep are more fun, but harder to trust. <laughs> Why does anyone do anything? Sheer, absolute boredom. Other Rituals when the Winter Court builds ritual fires, they burn reminders of their old human lives or their secrets. When they hold grand wakes in honor of all the lost who perish at the hands of the gentry, they drink little and let the other courts have the lion's share of the debauchery. Embers to Ashes The morning after the first heavy snowfall of the winter, the local court builds a gigantic bonfire for all to see. At noon, the fire reaches its peak. The court invites every citizen of the Freehold to cast something symbolizing their secret or their old human life into the blaze. Some Freeholders write letters to mortals who will never read them, or confessions that will never be read. These join other symbolic items on the blazing heap. By nightfall, the fire has been reduced to dull coals. At midnight, the coals are cold ash. Courtiers spend the rest of the night burying most of it. The next morning, the courtier who wears Winter's crown gives a traditional sermon reminding the freehold that once revealed, their secrets burn bright. It's better to let them cool inside one's heart so that they will not be destroyed. They dip their hands into a pail containing some of the remaining ashes and mark the foreheads of the new Winter courtiers to let the freehold know who they are. At this time, take note that I haven't truly explained the crown. This isn't unintentional. We will circle back around to that much later in another video. Nameless Mourning This ritual is a symbolic funeral for every changeling who died at the hands of the gentry. It's sad because one of the lost has died, but joyful because in death they escaped recapture. The Winter Court builds an effigy out of woven black branches. It invites the other courts to dress and decorate it. Winter tradition says that the result symbolizes the state of the freehold. A mannequin with gouty, mismatched accoutrement belongs to a confident, disorganized freehold. One in solemn, matching clothes stands for harmony and secrecy. A pallbearer from each court and two other winter courtiers carry the effigy to its gravesite, and a full funeral plays out according to local mortal customs. In America, multi-denominational services are common, but they are accented with fey superstition and freehold traditions. Once the effigy has been laid to rest, the freehold celebrates the freedom of death. A rowdy wake is the usual way to do it. Winter celebrants provide the venue and refreshments, but maintain their distance from the actual event. This not only approves the court's popularity, but teaches its subjects self-control. A true winter courtier never lets their guard down, even at a party. Also, this is like the most brutal snowman ever. Mantle The winter mantle is subtler than those of other courts. At lower levels, the onyx courtier might be confused for a courtless. At higher levels, an observer might mistake the courtier for someone much less potent than they are. If the silent arrow's primary goal is to elude notice, it would make little sense to proclaim one's power far and wide. The most prominent feature is a feeling of starkness. The winter mantle creates a sensation of stillness and clarity, of light falling in just that way that reveals the little details in the changeling surroundings. At its most powerful, or when the lost uses magic, winter becomes a bit more evident. A few snowflakes fall, or a faint, cold wind, hit you with a gentle touch. If a full flurry churns around a winter courtier, run. Court Variant Dead Season This is known as the Long Winter. During the tundra's long winter, the bleak and treeless landscape becomes a barren, windswept place devoid of life. Changelings of this court still follow sorrow and grief, but it is not passionate, sweeping sorrow of broken romance but the empty well of depression so deep that one can barely muster emotion at all. The mantle of such changelings is often reflected by dry, dead skin, empty eyes, cold lips, and a wide mouth as deep and dark as a bottomless pit. Heraldry The winter court's heraldic colors and symbols are small in number. The colors are mainly white and black, however they occasionally mix in gray. Regardless, the colors are almost always highly contrasted. Some symbols commonly used by the court are an arrow, a stiletto, icicles, holly leaves, 
a silence pistol, a wolf, a mouse, a hare, a mole, a stark tree, a gray mist or fog, an eclipse or a waning moon, a man with a beard, and others. Ho, ho, ho. Courtiers. Why join the coldest court? The honest court teaches its subjects how to survive freedom and taste it in stark, simple moments because loud, noticeable pleasures are far too dangerous. Other courts disagree. Like-minded changelings are free to leave winter and join them, but they can't ignore the power of secrecy and vigilance. Nobody can survive alone. There are no accolades to be had in the trackless cold, only merciless white purity so easily sullied that a frank word, erratic footstep, or foolish dream marks it as violently as blood striking ice, a scarlet flag that calls all enemies. Winter is the hiding time, the punishing time, when cold kills fools and snow covers them. Members of this court aren't just trying to conceal themselves from the Fae, they're also trying to live their own lives. To have a life, they have to draw a curtain between themselves and the Fae world. There is a degree of denial to it that some members of the court recognize. To truly hide from Fairy and all that it is, a changeling must also hide from themselves. However, separating themselves from Fairy and the weird isn't common in the court and only the most extreme members manage it. The court accepts those changelings who only want to run and hide, but with the knowledge that most will find themselves unable to live a normal life. Many changelings join the Winter Court when they're fresh out of fairy, but a more proportionate number remain a part of it. They end up helping, becoming the spy masters or fixers or assassins of the changeling world. The courts try to aid as many scarred changelings as they can, and few fey take the rejection so poorly enough to instead become courtless. Some Winter Clicks employ the Precious Crystal Rite, an ironic name for a simple test of the candidate's discretion upon attempting to join the court. One courtier tells a prospect a fake secret about another. She could reveal a love affair, addiction, or political ambition. Anything that isn't serious enough to merit a panicked response, but is interesting enough to tempt gossip. Once the elder courtier lets that secret fly, she and the established courtiers listen for it. The candidate fails if he tells the secret to anyone but the person it's supposed to be about. He also fails if he refuses to listen to the gossiping courtier. A member of the Silent Arrow should keep secrets well, but shouldn't pass up on opportunities to learn them. There are two basic ways to pass the test. The candidate's successful response affects how other courtiers treat him. If he keeps the secret for a prescribed period of time, usually a lunar month, they let him in on the test, which is of the flowing lore, and welcome him into the court. If he tells the subject of the gossip and nobody else what he's heard and how, he's applauded for honesty and loyalty. Also, he's been given a bit more trust than the changelings who just kept their mouths shut. Add two dice to mundane social roles when he deals with winter courtiers who know how he passed the test for the next month or so. Again, these set of guides aren't really system-based or contract-based yet. I'm just trying to get the lore out, but I have to kind of put that in for this. In the winter court, status is a matter of trust. The court uses stealth and deception to protect subjects against the gentry. Traitors and fools endanger the Silent Arrow, so its customs are designed to filter them out before they learn enough to harm anyone or assume duties that they can't carry out. The court rations out knowledge and favors based on this trust. The honest court's culture of secrecy includes a taboo against boasting, so it's hard to achieve recognition unless a changeling catches the extended attention of a senior courtier. Elder changelings also form close partnerships with less seasoned courtiers. This benefits them both. The veteran argues the neophyte's virtues before their seniors, while the neophyte helps them with projects that will improve their reputation. These groups of two to five courtiers are the Silent Arrow's basic political units. Some are autonomous autonomous, but many are linked so that the senior member of one is junior in another. This creates a natural cell structure, superior to one imposed by top-down rule due to the shared interests of members and the fact that it betrays no overall leader. When the Lords Unbidden and other high courtiers do take a hand in the system, they'll only force members of different cliques to work together when it's absolutely necessary. Cautious leaders limit close contact between the cliques so that only one or two changelings in a given group can expose anyone outside their own group. The court has no formal name for its cells, but in older freeholds, winter changelings develop local traditions, naming their cliques after Norse Drotti, or Italian Camore. Winter courtiers are subtle, sneaky, crafty, and dislike having their true motives known, even by their allies. Their allies, after all, are less adept at concealing the truth. The court spies on goblin markets, exiled fae, and even the true fae when they ride on earth. Winter courtiers also sometimes kill. The Silent Arrow is not just a poetic title. The court evades problems rather than solve 
solve them. It's a sort of solution. Whatever the trouble, it can't hurt them now, so it's okay. This callous attitude doesn't mean they don't help. Winter courtiers lend a hand getting other changelings out of the way, and they sometimes walk into trouble, trusting their skills to get them out of it again safe and well. The commander manages to distract the enemy, but never actually gets caught in battle. Nobody notices the winter socialite, but he's there soaking up information just the same. They make excellent silent partners in businesses. Other changelings occasionally call winter courtiers cowards, but they know that's not true. Stop exploding, you cowards! They call winter courtiers cowards because they're quiet. The Silent Arrow knows that stealth is no simple thing because it demands the supreme discipline required to hide your heroism and let insults fall unanswered upon your ears. Act, plan, but do not speak until after you've considered your words carefully. All the loss of fugitives, only a step or two ahead of their hunters. Caution is a watchword for the Winter Court. So is stealth and its cousin, humility. Let's not forget the word selfishness. The court exists for the benefit of its members above all, in proportion to their status and service. If one courtier exposes himself to the gentry, his comrades will only help him if they think there's a strong chance of success. If they can't, they'll cut him off from the court and leave him to his hunters. This is the Ice Law. Ice Law. The weak and valuable should lead the enemy away, not drag everyone else down with them. That's why the final word, cold, represents more than just the court's season. It's a studied, remote demeanor that stifles a courtier's ego and compassion in equal measure. The silent arrow is ever vigilant for signs of danger, especially if it's connected to the true fae. There are plenty of courtiers who don't care for these roles, but the ice law, ice law, strongly discourages winter subjects from duties that traditionally belong to the other courts. The Cold War was a defining time for the Winter Court. While the Autumn Court profited greatly from the fear of nuclear annihilation, the Winter Court learned to fuse many of the mortal innovations in espionage and deceit with their own fey talents for trickery. In terms of the other secret peoples, vampires, werewolves, wizards, and other stranger things. The Winter Court studies the rest of the supernatural world as thoroughly as it can without compromising the lost security. Changing the Lost, Winter Masks. Much like Autumn Nightmares for the Autumn Court, Winter Masks doesn't necessarily reflect 100% on what the Winter Court is. However, because of the title, I figured now might be the best time to explain what it is. Also remember this is a first edition supplement, so things changed a little bit when it went to second edition. Use it best as it suits your needs. Winter is a season of concealment and revelation. When the snow comes, they obscure the outlines of the land itself, providing a softer surface that conceals the many individual variations underneath. But at the same time, winter is a season of dead grass and leafless trees. Forests seem stricken to their skeletons and are no protection against the cold wind. The lost are creatures of similar duality. The mask protects them at all times, and yet it doesn't conceal them from their fellow changelings. They see through the snows to the bare branches underneath, and what they see there is a collection of beautiful scars. The marks of their abduction endurance weigh on them all, and it is up to the changeling to decide whether to hide them when he can or bear them proudly. This is a book about those scars, the seemings and kits of the loss, and the near infinite variety that marks them. Winter Masks is a book that emphasizes diversity. It should contain everything you need to know to show the loss of their most beautiful and grotesque, and to capture whichever of the thousands upon thousands of stories from around the world suit you best. Where the first part is concerned, this book is about the multitude of faces that changelings may exhibit, each one different from the next. A seeming is like a mask that cannot be removed. It is the new and changed nature of a changeling, and in some ways, their true face. But just as an old woman can look into the mirror and see the hints of a young woman she used to be, a changeling looks at her altered features and remembers the human that used to lie underneath. The choice to accept this mask as her own true face or to pursue the face of the woman that lies under it is a classic dilemma of the loss. But the mask has its own ideas. It grants special blessings as well as claiming a certain cost. Concerning the second part, this book is about masks particularly in the definition of a mass ball or revel. A seeming or kith is not something spontaneously generated or worn in a vacuum. It bears with it a number of social ties by implication. Two beasts attend a freehold gathering, even if they know one another as rivals. They share a certain closeness that is possible only among members of their seeming. They have both been reduced to the animal mind and fought their way back to the largely human mind. The kinship between changelings of a similar seeming is one of the basic blocks of lost society, where court is a matter of choosing one's friends and allies. Seeming is about the ties you possess that are beyond your control. Conclusion So that's it. 
I hope you enjoyed this broadcast on the Winter Court for Changeling the Lost. Their roles in Changeling are incredibly unique, and I hope I was able to illuminate their background as well as some of the use cases for implementing them. And remember, Ice Law. This has been Nick from the Botch Pit. Thank you.